As Pakistan continues to navigate through a complex and ever-changing political landscape, we are honored to have an opportunity to sit down with Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan. Mr. Khan's tenure as Prime Minister, which lasted from August 2018 to March 2021, was marked by a number of significant achievements, including the launch of the Ehsas program, the establishment of China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, and the development of a number of important infrastructure products. However, his tenure was also marked by a number of challenges, including a struggling economy, a tense relationship with India, and ongoing security concerns. In this interview, we will discuss Mr. Khan's reflections on his time as Prime Minister, his thoughts on current political situation in Pakistan, and his vision for the country's future. Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Khan. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing your precious time with Matic Studio. My pleasure. Uh, let me start back in 2018 when you first came into power. Um, Mr. Khan, what were the largest issues that were passed on to you from previous government? The, the biggest crisis was economic. We had twin deficits. The current account deficit, which is the external deficit, a dollar deficit, highest ever in our history. Uh, it was almost $20 billion, which was, you know, uh, never have we had such a huge uh, dollar gap in our country. And second was the fiscal deficit. So basically what happened was in the first year, the entire revenue collection uh, we did, half of it went into debt servicing. So as it is, we didn't have uh, huge revenues, but half of those revenues going to service the debts meant that there was nothing left, you know, for, for 220 million people. So that was the biggest crisis. Now, when it comes to corruption, we often hear about the big issues like a private school mafias or uh, like political scandals. But unfortunately, reality is that even at the lowest level, the average person in Pakistan is often the beneficiary of some degree of corruption. In a society like that, how did you um, try to like try to fight the corruption? And uh, do you think you were successful in your tenure? Look, corruption is a symptom of there not being rule of law. And I'm talking about corruption in the developing world, which destroys countries. You know, the reason countries are poor is because they're looted by the ruling elites of the developing countries. So this huge transfer of wealth takes place from poor countries. The elite siphons off the money to offshore accounts, to Western capitals, properties in London, in, in, in European capitals, in America. So what is happening is that the poor countries are getting poorer, the rich are getting richer because of the corruption of the ruling elites. So if you want to stop this corruption, there is only one way, rule of law. R rule of law means bringing everyone under the law. Now, problem with us, uh, the developing world and in Pakistan, a law enforcement our legal structures are so weak and deliberately they've been weakened for the, by the ruling elite so that they can take out money. If, if our institutions were strong, if our justice system was strong, then they would not be able to uh, uh, money launder from our countries. But because, because they take out money, they ensure that the, 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 that the accountability process, the institutions, which would hold the powerful accountable are weak. Right, yeah, so that being said, in trying to manifest those policies like the health card, how strongly do you think, how cooperative was the opposition party? Well, look, and the, the second part of your question, did I succeed? Answer is no. Because unfortunately, I was in a coalition government, not strong enough. And then we had this army chief who, 
who, di who, who did not think corruption was a bad thing. And unfortunately, he controlled the Accountability Bureau, which was called NAB. So the, NAB, the, the bureau which was supposed to hold the powerful accountable was controlled by him. And he didn't think corruption was a bad thing. So he, so I, so I was ineffective in bringing the powerful under the rule of law. So therefore, I failed, and that's why uh, you can only tackle corruption and and uh, and the powerful mafias if you come with a powerful majority in a parliamentary democracy. The second bit is about the health card. We had, you know, the opposition. Uh, basically, now when they've come to power, at least in one of the four provinces, they were, we were in power in, in two out of the four provinces where we had the health card, which is uh, universal health insurance. And unfortunately, already in one of the provinces, they've uh, they've shut down the, the the health insurance. And you mentioned how the opposition party removed this uh, policy once they came into the power. If you listen to the Western media outlets, the narrative around your ousted from power is that you were ousted because you couldn't deliver on your um, promises to the Pakistan's people. Is that true? Look, you know, opposition says you haven't delivered, you say you have, but there is only one way to find out who's telling the truth. And that is the economic survey of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. This is a the, the, this is a survey on Pakistan's yearly economic performance. It's published annually. The survey of which was published in May last year was published by this current government. If you look at that economic survey, Pakistan's economic performance was the best in 17 years. Mm -hmm. We overshot all our targets, whether they were revenues, they were exports, they were agriculture output, whether it was industrial production, you know, everything we overshot. We surpassed our targets. And remember, it was two years of COVID which, which we uh, had to cope with. And in COVID, the coping with the, one of the biggest crises, global crises in, in maybe 100 years, Pakistan was considered the three, three top countries that coped with the crisis the best. So why? So if the if this current lot says that we didn't manage it properly, just look at what has happened to Pakistan since we left a year ago. Pakistan is in a, a deepest economic crisis now. We are on the stage of defaulting on our on our loans. Our, our, our exports have come down. Our dollar in, 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 um, dollar intake has gone down, which is remittances and exports. And then not just that, industrial production. Uh, half of our industry is closed today. Our growth rate, which was 6% in our last year, is down to 0.4% now. So there's an unemployment. And inflation has broken all records in the history of this country. So therefore, I mean, um, the reason why the, the government is petrified of elections is because they know that uh, whenever there are elections, people will really punish this government for, 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 the, for the mess they have made of our economy. My next question would be about overseas Pakistani. Uh, do you, like during your tenure, you legitimized the vote of overseas Pakistans. Um, however, the current government has revoked that policy. What, what's your take on that? Well, that's because the government is, firstly, they're petrified of elections full stop. They don't want elections in Pakistan, even though, according to the constitution, you know, the moment the assembly is dissolved, provincial or national, elections are within 90 days. So we dissolved two of our provincial assemblies, uh, Punjab and out of the four, Punjab and uh, KP. But the government is running away from elections. They're actually violating the constitution. But what you're saying about the overseas Pakistanis, the, the, the government parties, this 12-party coalition knows that the overseas Pakistanis 
overwhelmingly support PTI, my party. And that's why they don't want them to, uh, to be able to vote. And we're talking about almost um, 10 million Pakistanis. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Khan, it is very rare for you to give a speech without mentioning youth. And as you know, and all of us know that last year, over 750,000 educated youth closed, um, they chose to leave Pakistan in order to seek employment um, elsewhere in the world. Uh, this is nearly triple from 2021, which was your last year in office. So what is your point of view on youth leaving the country in current political situation in Pakistan? Well, it's, you know, people losing hope. And why are the young people losing hope? Because imagine in Canada, if your criminals who've been looting your country for 30 years are brought back into power through a conspiracy by the army chief, that's what happened in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. The people who were branded as crooks were actually resurrected the cases were, they were deliberately, the cases were, weren't pursued, which I told you before that the National Account Accountability Bureau was about to convict a lot of them, current, uh, uh, along with the current prime minister. They were about to be convicted on billions of rupees of corruption cases. So the ex army chief, who General Bajwa, who was then the army chief, he protected them. And then he conspired. He is the one who started the conspiracy. And then he had our government removed and brought these people back into power. Now, these two families have been in power for 30 years in Pakistan. So bringing them into power, it has caused such disillusionment. And then on top of it, our economy has gone into a tailspin. The economy has tanked. So there's un growing unemployment. And that's why you have this despondency and people wanting to leave. Mm -hmm. Now, a little bit talk about uh, your presence um, in the world stage. Uh, throughout your tenure, you were very present at the world stage. And um, while you were in the spotlight, you were very vocal about your Islamic belief. Um, we, are we are witness of that at the UN, uh, you passed a resolution uh, to recognize March 15th as the International Day of Combat Islamophobia. And you organized the OIC conference in Islamabad, which was attended by 57 uh, member states. Mr. Khan, why do you spend so much time advocating for Muslims in international media? And uh, what responsibility do you think that the Prime Minister of Pakistan um, has to represent Islam on the world stage? Well, firstly, I mean, all the heads of Muslim states, it's their responsibility to explain to the Western countries or to the countries where there is Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. Islamophobia basically stems out of ignorance about our religion. And Muslims living in Western countries suffer, some more than others, but there is clear discrimination and especially after 9-11, terrorism and Islam was somehow equated. And, you know, unfortunately, there was hardly any um, attempt to explain to the Western countries that the two are not connected. I mean, terrorism knows no religion. You know, you have these guys every now and then in the United States, they go into schools and kill people or shopping mall and slaughter people. It's not because of their religion, it's just because of, you know, whatever a mindset they have. And that's what terrorism, actually, a lot of it is out of political causes. I mean, people out of political, perceived political injustices, uh, pick up guns. So therefore, uh, unfortunately, after 9-11, Islam was uh, equated with terrorism. And there was these words being used as radical Islam and and moderate Islam, which is all nonsense. There is only one Islam, and that is of a Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So therefore, because I knew the Western countries, I would lived there, I understood their culture, their mindset. So I thought it would be, I should at least try my best to make them understand, bring this, make people understand. 
that all these, uh, through ignorance, these prejudices against Islam. And that's what I try to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, how is the current government, uh, you think, dealing with this, re this responsibility representing Islam in world stage? I don't know. I mean, you know, they, I don't think they even think in these terms. I think there are just, these people are just, uh, you know, the same type of, these two families have ruled Pakistan for 30 years. And they have brought nothing but, but bad name to our country. Whenever you hear their mentions in Western papers, it's about the corruption, you know, of their lavish lifestyle or the London huge uh, luxury apartments, money stolen from people of Pakistan. They have, I don't think they have any bigger vision than just making money. And Mr. Han, we know that elections are coming and your goal seems to be to get a two third majority in the country. And I know you have a very extensive uh, platform. But if you are elected, can you briefly mention what your main policy uh, policy objectives will be? Look, my policy objective would be the same as when I started my politics 27 years ago, and it was called Movement for Justice. Look, my experience of the world, of the developed countries and the poor countries, the main difference is rule of law. If you have rule of law, you have prosperity. If you don't have rule of law, despite all the resources, you have poverty. So in Pakistan, the fight is for justice, to have a system where the weak are protected from the strong, and that will liberate the people. I call it real freedom, because we got freedom from the British, but we have not got freedom from the system, the unjust system, where the powerful are above law and the majority of people don't have access to justice. So when you have a system like this, it kills the potential of a country. That country can't grow. So I'll just give you an example. I mean, there are 140 out of 140 countries in the world. Denmark is number one in terms of rule of law. Mm -hmm. In the rule of law index, Denmark, Denmark is number one. I would imagine Canada is very much up there. Pakistan out of 140 countries is 129. Pakistan's, despite all the resources, far more resources than Denmark, our per capita income is $1,600. Denmark's per capita income is 68,600. So prosperity and rule of law go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Countries that don't have rule of law, which is what we don't have, they don't attract investment. People don't invest in countries that don't have rule of law. In fact, your capital flows out of your country. You have flight of capital, which is what is happening in Pakistan. So we can't attract investment. Because of not having rule of law, we can't have proper democracy. Because our electoral process is flawed. Because, you know, it is tampered. It is, there's cheating in that because we don't have rule of law. We can't nab the big crooks because they're above law. They, they can get away with anything. So they, they plunder the country. And most of all, you know, because you don't have rule of law, you can't stop corruption. So because you can't stop corruption, you don't have enough money. Money moves out of the country. That money can educate your people, develop your human resources, health, education, infrastructure. But you don't have the money because it gets stolen. So everything depends if a society can have a just system which protects the weak. The moment a system protects the weak, it liberates them. So people from our country, why do they go to Europe and Western countries and Canada? Because there is rule of law there. So hard work is rewarded. People who work hard and uh, follow the law and pay their taxes are free people. They have nothing to worry. Unlike Pakistan, unfortunately, where uh, you know we have a very corrupt system and that's the fight, rule of law.
Mm -hmm. And now talking about rule of law, Mr. Khan, why do you think uh, you will be more successful at achieving rule of law um, in your next time, or as specifically talking about at this time of the period? I will only be successful if I have a very clear majority. If I have a weak government like I had the last time, which was a coalition government, then it, there's no point in coming into power because you will not be strong enough to take on the, the powerful mafias who do not want to come under the law because they're benefiting from a corrupt system. Mm -hmm. And uh, you talked about uh, coalition government in the past and back in 2018. Um, are we going to rely on electables again when it comes to Pakistan, Tariq and Saf? Well, this time we've had a, you know, in Punjab giving tickets, we've had a mix and match. Most of the people we've given are young people, people who have come through our party. And yet we've given some tickets to electables too. But I think it's a very healthy mix this time. We've learned from our past mistakes. I know we have talked a lot about policy, politics, and Pakistan in general. I wanted to end with a more personal question. Throughout your lifetime, Mr. Khan, whether it was with cricket, Shokat Khanum Hospital, or now with politics, you have, from my perspective, consistently uh, been doing things that others told you was impossible. As a message to youth around the world, how do you stay motivated when faced with so much adversity? Well, look, I believe that we human beings have been given enormous potential by the Almighty Allah. All of us have it. The problem is that we are scared. We are scared of failure. We are scared of humiliation. We are scared of death. We are scared of losing our jobs. And this fear is what stops up us from achieving our dreams. Because, you know, the bigger your dream, the bigger the person. Nothing to do with your education or your, your, the amount of money you have. It's got to do with your, what you dream about. And then once, once, and I always followed my heart. I never did anything that my heart did not want to do. So all my life, you know, at, at the age of nine, I wanted to become a test cricketer. Mm -hmm. And I didn't care what anyone else said. That's what I wanted to be. And it was a passion. So I worked harder than anyone else. I had a lot of disappointments. You know, you have lots of ups and downs. But I never gave up. And I learned from my mistakes. And I learned how to take the bad times. I learned the ability to analyze my failures. And I was better at others than analyzing when I used to go wrong. And then I would work hard to improve myself. So this is the only way in life you go up. And eventually I, used to, I reached my goal. But then I never wanted to, you know, to, I could have lived off cricket for the rest of my life because the Almighty had given me such a position and name I never had to do anything from then onwards. I could have just talked about cricket, uh, you know, on television, and that's it. No, I wouldn't have had to do anything. But for me, life is, you know, one experience, reaching one uh, uh, goal prepares you for the next one. So I always had more and more ambitious goals. And each time I used to do, try and do something, everyone said it can't be done. So then I would, again, you know, I would, uh, I would, a lot of the time people would laugh at me, make fun of me, but I would keep pursuing my goals and, and the same principle, be your best critic. I would learn from my mistakes and then I would work harder than others, but never, never would I ever give up. And that's my principle. I never give up. So I don't care whether it, you know, whether it is a threat to my life. Right now, there's a big threat to my life. There is this intelligence officer. We call him Dirty Harry. He's twice tried to kill me. Once I survived with my bullets in my legs. The other time, um, he again tried to have me killed in this judicial complex in Islamabad on the 18th of March. But that's never going to stop me. 
because I have a clear goal in my mind. I have a strong faith in God that life and death are in Almighty's hands. We try and be caught. You know, we take precautions, but we should never be scared of death, of failure, of, of, uh, of losing our livelihood. Because as a Muslim, I, my faith is that, you know, we try our best, then leave, we leave it to the Almighty. Beautiful. Thank you so much uh, for that inspirational message and your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Han. That brings us to end of our interview. And it was a pleasure having you with us in Batik Studio today. My pleasure.